Well, thanks everyone for uh, coming. Uh, my name is John Desjardins. I am the CTO here at Hazelcast, and I'm joined on stage here with uh, Neil Stevenson. Hi. Uh, I'll introduce myself and let Neil introduce himself. Um, I joined Hazelcast four years ago from Cloudera. Uh, I'm a big fan of open source, and uh, I was the potential of taking a lot of the kind of capabilities that we had at Cloudera, but being able to do them in real time and with a much simpler uh, architecture uh, that could also deliver zero downtime, which when you go from batch to real time, suddenly you're a real application that people use and five nines becomes actually important. So all of those things led me to come to Hazelcast and uh, really excited about uh, our talk today. Um, started to get involved with Finos last year because of uh, our customer, Morgan Stanley, and um, was having a look at different projects. Um, um, one of uh, our longstanding supporters at Morgan Stanley, Stephen Goldbaum, is uh, one of the leads for the Morpher project at Finos. And um, yeah, so anyway, I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you guys about how we can uh, uh, process data in real time, financial services data, and then visualize that data with the uh, perspective uh, framework. And uh, Neil will be uh, helping to demonstrate that capability. Thank you, John. Um, so just a very quick hello. Uh, I'm Neil Stevenson. I've been at Hazelcast for six years. Um, previously, I was working for a number of consultancy firms, and we just loved open source software. I was using Hazelcast. I got in touch with the Hazelcast guys and I said, ah, your software is great, but it's missing this feature. And the answer I got back was, why don't you build it? So that was my introduction to Hazelcast. And I'll, I'll hand back to John because I'm conscious we're short of time, but that's the way it goes with open source. You don't just take, you also give. So yeah, so thanks for uh, coming today. We're going to talk a little bit about what Hazelcast is. I'll talk a little bit about how it's used in different financial services areas and then how we envision it working with perspective and potentially with some of the other uh, Finos projects. And um, we'll talk uh, a little bit about also some of our key differentiation or, or differences. And then um, we'll hand it off to Neil to demonstrate the uh, perspective and uh, Hazelcast capabilities. So this is our, our vision. Uh, this is why I get excited to come to work every day at Hazelcast is that uh, you know, our goal is to empower the world, meaning we, we think that this should be a democratized technology that all companies of different sizes can take advantage of to work with data and not just know about things, but to act. So when you start to think about real-time data, uh, if I pull all that real-time data up onto a dashboard, and I'm looking at the dashboard, and then I have to go to the bathroom or eat lunch, I'm, it's not really real-time in the sense that there's no action when I'm not looking at the data. And so we're talking about real-time in the sense where we can trigger automated actions driven by rules, machine learning, business logic, or, or, or fed out via alerts and other, other ways. And uh, we do run everywhere, so we have everything from uh, people running Hazelcast on things like heavy trucks and uh, in warehouses and factories to uh, um, uh, people running us, uh, you know, obviously, in the cloud and data centers. And we work with streaming and stored data. Our biggest uh, users are in the financial services uh, industry, um, working in real time uh, with uh, a lot of things. Uh, securities trading data is continuously uh, changing, and, and so being able to analyze that data and work with it is, is critical, but also payments. Um, and really, everything is moving even more to real time. Uh, you look at corporate payments, and uh, you know that world is now moving to caring about instant payments and real time payments. and, and oh, well, wait a minute, what does that do to our cash flow? So now we need real-time visibility of our liquidity, real-time uh, you know, analytics of you know, the influence of foreign exchange, you know, which, yeah, you know, foreign exchange isn't like a, a real-time thing, except, well, actually right now it kind of is. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so um, you know, uh, we really see you know, from the trade execution side 
that real time has flowed through the financial system to every part of finance now caring about real time and a lot of other industries as well. We, we, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know, it's not just about analyzing, but things like real time offers um, of, of banking products and investment or you know, uh, real time offers and lending and things like that. If you know what someone's doing at that moment as they're banking and you offer them like a payday loan, for example, you probably don't want to offer someone a payday loan when you know they just got paid. <laughs> you know, maybe you need to you know know some context. Uh, we're big into open source and uh, in the ecosystem, and that's why we're here today. And um, you know, so we've got a lot. These are some of our some of our sort of top partners uh, to just highlight a few. But uh, um, I'm going to call out in particular our, our friends at Red Hat, um, who uh, you know uh, we're we're actively working with and. And they also gave us a shout out earlier, so I want to make sure we do that. But uh, you know, we're, uh, we're we're actively partnering with all the data technologies, all the cloud vendors, and and uh, many other uh, uh, others, um, you know, in the ecosystem. So I'm going to move past this slide because uh, I think you know uh, everybody sort of understands it. But you know, for context, if you get the presentation later. You know, you have some idea examples of real-time SLAs from the real world. The only one I'm going to hit on is the Google Rail model. Uh, Google studied people's expectations for applications, and they analyzed this extensively because Google doesn't really do things sort of halfway. And they they found that uh, people, when they click on something, they expect a response within 100 milliseconds that says, "Yes, my app saw me click, and it's doing something." and Within a, a thousand milliseconds or one second, they expect that the data is starting to load. And if any of those things don't happen, they think the app's broken, the network's down, something's wrong. So that means that latency is the same as downtime. What's different about Hazelcast is that we work with both data in motion and data at rest in a unified, not product, a unified runtime. So we're talking about one server and you know, one jar file. What do we offer in terms of the capabilities of this runtime? So most people who do know us, how many people have heard of Hazelcast? A lot of you have heard of us. You probably know us for caching, uh, you know, or maybe being a data grid. Um, you know, so you have applications and they need to have fast response to data, so they may write to Hazelcast, and we may write through uh, asynchronously to other databases uh, where that data may live for longer periods. But uh, you know, by writing through Hazelcast, you can get you know sub millisecond read and writes um, for for you know your application, and um, because we also can replicate continuously active active across data centers or cloud regions, that means we can deliver five nines. We also have like zero downtime, rolling upgrades, and other other features to deliver uptime, um, and that also means that the databases we're sitting in front of can be taken down sometimes and the application doesn't know. But we also actually do a whole other thing, which is uh, the in-memory store has evolved to do computation. And it started with just the idea, hey, I'm putting all this data in Hazelcast, but I want to query that data that I've put into my key value store. And you know, if my query runs on the cluster, it's going to execute faster. And so we started doing more and more computation. We realized there was real power in that. Uh, not moving data is a key to performance. And so uh, we introduced our streaming and batch processing engine or our distributed compute capabilities. And that allows you to process continuously changing data being fed in from your Kafkas, your MQs, could be fed in from IoT devices, could be fed in from just raw network streams. Uh, Anything that's a TCP IP protocol, if you send it to a Hazelcast cluster, might take a little bit of custom coding, but we'll figure out a way to, uh, to uh, receive that data and process it. Um, and we can do that in very real time. Um, this is what I used to work with in Cloudera and a lot of other data platforms in the open source space have this, uh, you know, the official Delta Architecture is another vendor, but I'm not going to talk about them because I didn't work there. Um, but you know, you get data coming in, and you store the data, and then you query the data, and then you take the outputs of that query and you store it, and then you maybe do some more 
preparation and eventually get to like a data product that is a high quality data for a particular use case, there's a lot of storing. And most of the time that storing is on spinning disks. <laughs> spinning disks are bad. Uh, and you know nowadays, uh, uh, MVME is super fast. Uh, and then, of course, we also partner with Intel. We can use their Optane memory, which is like Flash that you stick inside your server directly. So this is about architecture if you care about real time. It's also about architecture if you care about zero downtime. There's a lot of moving parts. I'm not going to go into those moving parts. We don't have those moving parts. We have one runtime, a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. So Every node of Hazelcast has a bit of the data and is going to do a bit of the computation. So we're not just partitioning the data to allow you to scale the data storage, but we're partitioning the ingest, the query. We can you know, execute the machine learning algorithms on the particular node where my data lives or where Falaz's data lives or where Neil's data, they may be on different partitions, whether it's a, you know, uh, our, our investment banking and trading accounts or whether it's our you know, payments and deposit accounts. All that data, you know, the, the Hazelcast knows where that data lives and we can partition the compute by saying, uh, you know, partition by account ID or, part, you know, so that input stream we can distribute across the cluster. Or if we want to do a particular query, we can also execute that query on the cluster in, in a way where it, it knows where the data is and it's going to execute where the data is and so you're not moving data over the wire and that's going to bring those uh, execution times for your compute down typically under a millisecond. Um, and uh, so, um, but the other cool thing about that is if I add nodes, I'm adding capacity for my compute, for my analytics, for my uh, data. I'm also only losing, you know, one uh, out of however many nodes n is, you know. So if you have like 35 nodes in a cluster and you lose one node, you've lost 1 35th of your data and your compute. Of course, we have backup copies of the data on other nodes and we will restart the compute on other nodes. So all you're going to get is a brief pause in the compute and the data won't be lost. We can also write the data out to disk, uh, and so we can actually have that additional guarantee that we will not lose your data. So we will not lose your data, and we're going to execute a very real time. And we can do so in a way that's very easy to operate, because it's just a Java application. I can go to any company in the world and go, hey, we've got this new thing. It's Hazelcast. We're putting it in production. It's just a Java application. Do you know how to run those? Most people can do that. At Cloudera, we were like, who are your best people in your ops teams? We're going to send them to Cloudera training, and that's all they're going to do now, and they're not going to be doing other uh, operational tasks. Um, but that scale out also means we are fast, and uh, the, that model allows us to do stream processing with uh, over a billion events per second. I think we're, we're benchmarks uh, have have gone up to somewhere around six or eight billion per second, um, and we're able to do so with consistent low latency. So this is a real world benchmark, and uh, we um, uh, were able to hit 30 millisecond, 99% uh, latencies on a real world query engine. By comparison, Flink and Spark, well, let's just say don't go past a million events per second with Flink and Spark. And by the way, if you try to do this with KSQL, uh, we don't even put KSQL on this chart because uh, after like 5,000 events per second, you're going to start to get ugliness in uh, KSQL with latency. So that's why I think it's cool. Um, and it's used in a lot of the biggest banks in the world, including probably somewhere in a lot of the banks if you're working uh, for a bank and or if you're not working for a bank, it, it could very well be the case that it is um, uh, actually, uh, you know, um, something that you know, if your customer is a bank, that they're probably using Hazelcast um, in many areas. Real-time offers at PNB Pariba. Um, we've got uh, authorization and fraud uh, processing for every single cardholder, every single transaction at Capital One. We're also using a lot of the biggest retail sites in the world, like Target. Um, and um, you know, uh, basically, if you care about performance and you need five nines, 
people tend to use Hazelcast. Um, uh, sometimes there are other technologies that are similar in terms of one or other part, but uh, they're not providing both, right? They're not providing uh, distributed on-grid scalable compute where we do all of the job management and, and work, workload sharing uh, across the cluster and even across threads. Um, and in fact, um, you know, I, I, I think we're very unique in our peer-to-peer um, job management and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, distributed execution. This, this, by the way, works very similar to Flink and Spark in that it is a directed acyclic graph. So the pipeline of logic is broken out into stages. Those stages can be running in different threads or on different nodes of a cluster, um, but it's data aware. Um, and again, um, you know, it also is automatically distributing that, that, that work. So as you add nodes to a cluster, they say, hey, I need some work, I need some data, and you know, that scaling is very elastic. So that is kind of a quick run through of Cloudera, I'm sorry, of Hazelcast versus Cloudera, sorry. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna pause there for questions before we talk a little bit more about how we, how we see working with FinOS. So Flink is very similar architecturally to uh, Spark, right? It has a master worker. There are executors, there's a master node. If the master node goes down, then you know, no jobs get distributed and you don't really know what's going on. Uh, so you have to have a backup for the master node, but it's an active passive, right? The workers are more of a distributed model. Um, you know. Uh, Flink and Spark require some place to store the data during the pipeline uh, that you have to add into the architecture. So that's another moving part. So it's a lot of moving parts. So our difference is not a lot of moving parts. Um, and you know, that means that we can uh, execute the data, uh, so, or, uh, uh, you know, continuously process with, with, with high uptime and high resilience. The other difference is the fact that we have this we're built on a data grid, so that means that uh, you know every node has data and is able to do continuous processing. So you're not moving data over the wire, and so if you're not moving data over the wire, again you're you're saving on latency, and you're becoming more efficiently efficient with how much hardware you're going to need to run. That's going to mean less nodes in uh, your cloud or less nodes in your data center. So we're going to. We're gonna do a lot more throughput with less hardware. Um, that also means just in terms of how much raw data we can move, um, we can, you know, we often are replacing Spark as people start to realize, like, I have a need to run something in Spark. It's great at throwing compute at lots of nodes, but it just assumes that compute is cheap and storage is cheap. That's the basic architectural assumption of the whole big data world was, yeah, you know, it doesn't really cost that much to like run five more nodes and like, well, if I'm trying to do risk calculations, <laughs> I probably don't need just five more nodes. I might need, you know, 50 more nodes or 100 more nodes, depending on what my SLA is. It also means that whether your SLA is I want to run a risk calculation every minute or every 30 seconds or every hour, that we can continuously do that calculation. Um, and in and, and, and like risk, we're often used also for aggregating all of the data needed for those risk calculations. So some of our customers uh, you know, are basically pulling all of the data, aggregating the data into Hazelcast where we can use the streaming to aggregate or integrate and then the data grid to serve the data. Um, but then they might use something like data synapse or something else that they already have in place because they already have it and we're just providing a super fast data source. So, um, but that super fast data source now needs to be up to date uh, continuously during the day. Uh, what, you know, maybe I am not running my risk calculations continuously, maybe I'm running them every hour. But 
guess what? If some event happens, I also want to be able to just run an ad hoc calculation right when you know a country gets invaded or some other like cryptocurrency, you know, Elon Musk does a tweet. So I can you know, use those events to just determine I need to rerun my risk on a particular asset class or a particular whatever. So there's other examples and um, you know, we can deliver a particular window of latency with a particular deployment very, very consistently because of our architecture. And when you get into Spark, Flink, and similar technologies, like maybe you can tune it and you get pretty good latency, but when you get a spike or something like that, then like all bets are off. Um, and you know, it doesn't just, you can't just go scale a Spark cluster plus the supporting data and all the other pieces to handle the fact that today, you know, we have twice the normal trading volume, uh, whereas, uh, you know, you could do that with Hazelcast. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Neil to talk. Oh, sorry. I, before I get to that, I, um, you know, uh, the, the FinOS perspective uh, was the first project that we, we selected to work with because um, people often do want to see what's going on in, inside of this platform, even though what we really want to do is automate the actions and the responses to the data. And um, this seemed like one of the better tools for uh, this in open source in financial services that we'd been kind of seeing. And you know, we've integrated with like Grafana and, and uh, Kibana and things like that. So uh, we just thought like, you know, we should we should try to integrate with this. It's what I would call a sort of alpha of, of the integration and. Um, you know, we are going to continue to, to improve that. And when we get it to where we think it's like beta-able, we will put it out um, and contribute it. Well, we're not gonna, we already have Hazelcast open source. We will show how Hazelcast open source can, use, can be used um, with, with uh, perspective. And then um, we're gonna also start to look at what other projects. Um, I'm intrigued, uh, I, I kind of didn't really understand Legend as well until my last talk, I, I just attended theirs. and. I'm keen to have you know that as a data source, and um, you know we're used with like uh, chatbots uh, to provide AI-driven, real-time you know uh, conversational banking or you know conversational customer engagement and things like that, and uh, so we're we're intrigued by maybe integrating more with the Symphony uh, platform, um, and we're we're looking for more ideas. Uh, we're definitely uh, also um, going to take a look at how we could execute more for within Hazelcast, um, you know, runtime, so that we could e allow more for rules to be executed with with our speed and performance. So with that, I will hand it okay, over to you. Thank Neil. you, John. Oh, and my microphone is on. Okay, so um, I'll just talk briefly on a slide, and then I'll swap swap to my laptop just to give you a little bit of background. Uh, so the example we have here is uh, continuous querying on a stream of trades. And what we mean by a stream of trades is we have some sort of connection to the stock market which is coming into our business through an airlock and it's sitting on a Kafka topic. So we're getting somebody is buying X thousand IBM, somebody is buying X thousand of stock ABC, X thousand of stock DEF. And we want to know... Um, what's happening in the market, what volumes are being traded, because this is a thing we're, we're interested in for optimizing our business. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to read off a Kafka topic and keep a running total. Uh, it doesn't sound like rocket science, uh, and indeed it's not. So if we just plug into my laptop, hopefully the screen will change. don't want keyboard setup assistance. So if we just take a very brief look at our uh, trade data. So it's coming in on the Kafka topic. This is um, CAFDROP. And basically, we've just got a piece of JSON that's coming in. And what we're doing with this JSON is we're reading this into Hazelcast. Uh, it's the NASDAQ stocks, so there's about 3,000 of them. It's a five-node Hazelcast cluster. So that means each node has got to keep track of 600 running totals on the stock. Now, if you did this in a database, that's a group by query 
That's an aggregation. That's essentially a table scan. It's not the sweet spot of what a database does. Uh, at large volumes, you find that query might take four hours to tell you what's happening. Here, we're doing it immediately. We're getting the current volumes of the 3,000 stocks on the NASDAQ on five nodes. If you had 6,000 stocks, you could just go to 10 nodes or whatever number you need. Now, if you're in the stock market, this is just your core business logic. You might look at this and say, whatever that one on the top, Esperian Therapeutics, done 42 million so far today. You can see the numbers change in front of your eyes, but maybe 43 million, that seems a bit on the high side. Uh, that maybe takes you into some sort of drill down. We want to see what are the individual parts that have made up that sale. Um, is it like a hedge fund that's done a massive movement or is it lots of institutional investors following the advice of Robin Hood? But fundamentally that only gets you so far and it just starts what if questions. Uh, and that's when you get into SQL. Uh, you maybe can't see that too clearly on the screen. Maybe you can, let's try it. Uh, what this query is, it's a join on a Kafka topic with data that's in Hazelcast. So when you do a query, most of the time, you don't really care where that data's come from, you're just interested in the answer. So Hazelcast can query using SQL data that Hazelcast has uh, with data that's somewhere else that Hazelcast knows how to get hold of it. But the reality is if uh, you're not going to stare at screens, as John mentioned, what you want is alerts. So you might get alerts, and here we go, there's our Slack system, we're getting alerts coming out. If you're a, a senior manager, you're not sitting, you're in meetings and whatever, suddenly there's a buzz on your phone, something's gone mad in the markets, a ship has got stuck in the Suez Canal. Google that, another ship got stuck somewhere else from the same company. I'm sure it can be <laughs> a coincidence. Yeah. So this is Hazelcast, but let's have a look at the um, Finos perspective. So this is Finos perspective connected to, so that's running in a Jupyter notebook on my desktop. It's connected to a Hazelcast cluster running out in the cloud. And if we just look at the code, uh, scroll up, there we go. That's all the code and essentially it's just an SQL query. Select star from portfolios and then it's just, Finos is doing all the, the heavy lifting with the perspective. And I can put that query into, um, into Slack and I can go, go and do it that way, the same query. Here comes back my result. Uh, but that's like a static query and what perspective is doing nicely is just this um, running it uh, continually and giving us this moving view. And I can do all the nice parts. I can change it into you know, like an X bar and whatever and see uh, how that stock all moves. So that was kind of it for the demonstration because we're very low on time. But if you wanted, you can look at that same data using like an SQL interface. This is dbver, it's just a JDBC connection. Uh, where's the refresh button? Can't see the, where's refresh? Over there. Ah, never mind. There is a refresh button somewhere that I can't see. That's what happens on a live demo. So there's our data in Hazelcast. We can see it changing in perspective. We can see, we can manipulate it from wherever we happen to be. If you're close enough, I could be doing this on my cell phone. Any questions? We've got a minute and a half left. Well, there's another variety. SQL is just one that everybody likes. So that is currently running, uh, like it's an SQL that runs and produces a finite result set, but Hazelcast also does SQL that does infinite results. So if you're doing something like querying Kafka topic, which is essentially a queue, that never ends. So you can do a, an infinite query against uh, certain data sources if it's like an event stream, or you can do a finite query if it's something like a map or a table or something that's um, finite. Yeah. So. Fundamentally, and the question was around our SQL capabilities, we, we support both streaming SQL, where we can take a stream of data and treat it like it's a table, effectively, and, uh, and the data that we're storing, where it's working like a database, and we can also combine those. And 
Uh, some of the SQL logic for streaming is like window based that is sort of a specific syntax that you know you wouldn't necessarily uh, you know have out of the box for data tools and then some of it is uh, you know like if you're just selecting from selecting from sources uh, Kafka topic then it just works like SQL and so uh, that would be uh, very easy to you know plug into this tool but that's actually um, where we're looking to take this next is to try to figure out that tighter integration. We're also looking at um, beyond just this this framework. Um, we're looking at uh, better uh, out of the box support for Apache Arrow. Um, uh, you know, we we do uh, like work with uh, Avro and Parquet and a lot of those kind of formats from the the data world. Um, but um, Arrow is one that is on on the, the roadmap as well for us. Um, so yeah. I think we're out of time, but uh, any other quick questions or otherwise uh, we can catch us um, over at our booth. Oh, okay. uh, quick question. So is this kind of building a layer for streaming, stream processing <coughs> and servers, or can we use it on top of, let's say, a data warehouse database or something? Yeah, we can be yeah. pulling data from anywhere and working with the data and keeping it in Hazelcast and making it super fast. It doesn't matter where the data is. We also can do like change data capture. So we could be doing change data capture from your data warehouse if it supports some sort of change data capture format um, and then feeding that in as a stream to continuously keep Hazelcast up to date. And we could be either querying that stream in real time, but we could also be storing that data in Hazelcast for fast analytics um, where you know you really care about uh, those, those ability to kind of, again, query like the last days of data and those kind of things. So hopefully that in terms of format, you can query things like a CSV file or an S3 bucket, it, yeah. you know, all sorts of um, possibilities. Your data is going to be in a range of silos in the world. Yeah, we're often used as a, you know, common operational data layer in front of lots of databases and then real-time computation on that operational data. So that's a very common use case for us in financial services, whether it's an aggregated view of positions and latest exposures or an aggregated uh, market data uh, hub or, or you know, um, and maybe you're trying to do real-time FX calculations, pricing and things like that. So um, all, all kinds of uses, payments, uh, real-time payments. Um, one of the things we also do really well is we can run the ML algorithms in a distributed way in a data aware way so that we can actually execute this, you know, a fraud algorithm in, in less than a millisecond. All right, thank you guys for thank coming you. and uh, feel free to stop by the booth to have a deeper conversation.